This program contains content that may disturb some viewers. The gifts are imparted by the Holy Spirit. He was a self-styled Messiah, promising salvation to his followers. He uh, told me that he's there to um, uh, spread the gospel, to start a church. But he took their money, brutalising women and children. I was on a number of occasions suicidal. So did you believe that you were born evil? That's what I was told. While he sexually abused many of the men. My brain was just going absolutely crazy. I couldn't understand why I would do such a thing. Why would I... Um, surrender to somebody in such a way. How did he get away with it? Welcome to Four Corners. There's a depressingly familiar pattern to the appeal of religious cults and the vulnerability of people who are drawn to them. A pattern that includes strict obedience to the leader who demands control of all elements of the follower's life, psychologically and physically. Such leaders then surround themselves with a small exclusive clique and will not tolerate criticism or dissension. The cult we're reporting on tonight, an evangelical Pentecostal group called Christian Assemblies International, was formed in Germany nearly four decades ago by a self-appointed pastor, an Australian named Scott Williams. He subsequently led many of his followers to Scotland and finally to Australia, the whole while subjecting many to brutal psychological and sexual abuse. One of the staggering things about this story was the apparent ease with which Williams was able to set up a pseudo-charity in full view of authorities, stockpiling money and property while claiming tax benefits. Former disciples who have broken away from the cult say Williams has successfully manipulated the justice system to stay out of jail. Caro Meldrum Hanna reports. This is a man in recovery. Gunther Franz was abused by the leader of a secretive religious cult based in Australia. First as a boy, then as a man, for almost 30 years. Oh, it's not nice. Am I touching you? Or are you forced to touch him? That's hell on earth. How many times do you think could you count? I can tell you hundreds and hundreds of times. Hundreds of times? Hundreds and hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of times. You have no idea. Sorry. Today, swimming is a form of therapy for Gunther Franz. It's also how he came to know his future abuser, an Australian man, and where this story begins poolside at a military school for young men in Feldafing, Bavaria, Germany, in 1978. Gunther Franz was 12 years old. I was in a club there, um, uh, usually trained there every Wednesday. A promising swimmer, Gunther Franz had caught the eye of the school's new pool attendant. His name was Scott Williams. 34 years old, a fun-loving Australian, charismatic, outgoing and charming. Williams took an immediate liking to Gunter Franz and his older brother. He uh, told me that he's there to um, uh, spread the gospel, to start a church. So um, he told me that he has, yeah, is uh, having a church and he's, he's a pastor of a church, yes. Scott Williams was lying. He wasn't the pastor of a church. Instead, he was a self-styled guru with no religious qualifications. And he was on a mission to create his own Pentecostal revival, his own Christian assembly. Anyone who is not within the church is um, a heathen who is going to burn in hell. 
um, uh, and they either convert or die, and um, uh, you have nothing to do with them. Scott Williams was persistent and highly convincing. He needed people power. Soon, Williams invited Gunther and his older brother to spend social time with him when swimming training had finished. They began to go to the sauna together after hours. We were naked, yeah. In the 13 year old boy and his older brother were having a naked sauna with a, yep. a, a much older man yep. at the school. Yep. Over six months and in secret, the naked saunas and showers, coupled with intense scripture lessons, continued at the direction of Scott Williams. They were followed by lengthy massages. Did he claim to be chosen by God? Absolutely. What would he say? Oh, that God has sent him uh, to this country to convert all of Germany and all of Europe. Yeah, but mainly the Germans. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man. To Scott pray. Williams encouraged men in his assembly to have close relationships with other men. Seen here, praying over one another in later years. He called the relationship a Bundschaft, a German word related to covenant. The policy of the Bundschaft would later become compulsory for almost everyone. Senior men in the church had to have a male partner and their bond was above that of husband and wife. To use the words of the assembly, to use Scott's words, it's like a, like a marriage without sex. They were expected to lie almost naked, basically in the same bed, and cuddle each other, massage each other. That was a big thing. And uh, basically have be very, very intimate, as you will probably be intimate with your girlfriend or your wife. Gunther Franz became Scott Williams' Bundling and one of his most senior and trusted advisors, making him a powerful figure inside Williams' evangelical Pentecostal group. Treated to a rock star welcome at the Assembly's annual general meeting in 1996. My whole body started to shake. Mein ganzer Körper fing an zu schütteln. Everything became like hot inside. Alles wurde mir total heiß. And my tongue started to move. Meine Zunge fing an sich zu bewegen. Steve Falken was another of Scott Williams' early converts in Germany. He was 17 years old and still at school. Most of the people in the organisation were in their late teens, early 20s, so it was a very sort of vibrant, young community. In Europe, Williams quickly surrounded himself with more and more young men and women. He claimed to be filled with the Holy Spirit, gifted with the divine power of healing. When Scott prayed for me, I knew within my heart that the illness was totally gone. It was in Australia that Scott Williams first attempted to set up an assembly. He was a high school teacher, first at Ballarat East in Victoria, pictured here in the early 1970s, then in New South Wales. Scott Williams, pictured here with his wife Ree, went to Western Sydney, where it's alleged he ran into trouble for using his role as a school teacher to indoctrinate dozens of teenage students. He left Australia in 1976 under a cloud. In Germany, Scott Williams soon caught the eye of the local authorities. It very quickly grew to about 100 people, I would say in the first two years, at which point Scott was um, told by the German authorities he had to leave. Williams was reportedly running an unregistered charity and vast sums of money Mandatory offerings from members, in addition to 10% of their gross income, were pouring into a bank account 
controlled by Williams. Well, we didn't have anything registered at that time, so it was really um, a money laundering exercise, really. I personally drove off the money every month over to the border, over Austria, and um, uh, deposited it into different accounts um, uh, illegally, yeah. Under pressure, in the mid-1980s, Scott Williams fled to Scotland, ordering his members to follow him. He settled in the small county of Clackmannanshire and successfully registered his church as a charity, later known as Christian Assemblies Europe International. Williams had learnt from past mistakes. Klaus Tischer, another early German convert, worked in the Assembly's finance department. He says Williams devised a new way to collect money from his congregation, which was now in the hundreds spread across Europe. He moved the money around by not even putting it through the banking system. People were set up from the length and breadth of Europe to courier to drop-off points. So large amounts of cash were being couriered across Europe. Yeah. Yeah, well, we sometimes we're frightened for the people who were driving around at night in their cars. If they had an accident or something and people would find all these wads of money in there, they would go like, what's going on here? Using the growing fortune amassed from his members, Scott Williams went on a spending spree, building an impressive property portfolio. His first purchase, a large house in dollar in his own name followed by Pitversy House, in the church's name, an impressive £270,000 mansion. Is it a lavish place? It's a really beautiful place. It's a big house. It's set up like the Queen's Palace inside. Were you allowed to enjoy these properties? Use them at your free will? No. Um, Who were they reserved for? The pastor. <laughs> Pastor Scott Williams' final purchase, a hotel in Abernathy. We're about to open Douglas House for the glory of the Lord, and many of you here have worked upon it. So what I'll do, I'll commit it into the hands of the Lord. So just pray with me. The pressure to work hard and donate more and more to Pastor Scott Williams' church knew no bounds. Every possible source of money was targeted. Pensioners, students, widows. We've even found evidence of members being fined by Scott Williams. Klaus Tischer's wife was pressured to hand over her inheritance when her father died. She was asked to give it to the glory of God, because God's work, which happened to have been uh, used for the purchase of the headquarters in Scotland. Pastor Scott Williams grew all-powerful, and life in the assembly began to change. In the minds of his believers, Williams held the key to their salvation, and leaving wasn't an option. He would get really, really angry, and he would basically freak out. And uh, obviously everybody sort of feared for their life, in a way. It's a web. It's like he's the spider and he's got you there and you can't get out of the bloody spider web because he um, injects that indoctrinated poison to believe once you're out of that net, you're, you're condemned for life. Sylvia Wagner was an outgoing, independent 21-year-old woman living in Germany when she was first introduced to Christian Assemblies International in 1993. I was a hippie. I was engaged to a rock musician. <laughs> I was a pretty wild chook. Yeah. Sylvia Wagner's colleague, already a member of the church, dragged her along to a two-week camp here in Cornwall, England, run by Pastor Scott Williams. You say that this is when you were brainwashed. Yes, yeah, I strongly believe that. 
When Sylvia Wagner tried to leave the camp, she was told she would be attacked by Satan and that people outside the church were evil, including her fiancé. What did they tell you about your boyfriend? Oh, they told me if I got married to him, my kids will become drug addicts, I will not be blessed, um, I shouldn't be yacht together with someone who was an unbeliever. Brainwashed, Sylvia Wagner left her fiancé. Alone in the assembly, she grew increasingly desperate. I was told I can only marry someone within the church, that I wasn't free to marry who I wanted to marry. Um, but I also didn't want to stay alone, so I um, asked somebody to um, tell me what I should do, and they said I should pray. Sylvia Wagner prayed and prayed. What she didn't know was that behind the scenes, church members were plotting, choosing a husband for her. What's your greatest regret? I regret not marrying the man that I really loved. I really regret that. Like, it's really hard for me. It's really... And the vows which I'm about to read are very powerful. Arranged marriages, are they a feature or a hallmark of a cult? That's a hallmark of a cult. You get two families, now they're joined together through marriage in the system. They're more committed to the system. For women like Katja Falken, life inside Christian Assemblies International was a living nightmare. So were women on equal footing to men? No, definitely not. Where did you no. come in the chain of Well, I command? suppose we were like, we were servants, really. Women were constantly monitored and their lives were completely controlled. How we were dressed, how we cooked, how we behaved towards our husbands, how we brought up our kids, cleanliness of the house, cleanliness of the house, everything. Church videos show women happily taking part in assembly life, but the reality was often very different. And these couples out the front represent... Women have told us they were subjected to a strict regime executed by Pastor Scott Williams. They all stand before us as virgins. It started with verbal abuse, in private and in public. Virginal, praise God. He would get up, you yeah. unbelieving bastards, I have this vision and you don't believe in this vision. Evil, satanic bitches, whores. On one occasion I was called a Nazi bitch. Witches, Nazis. Yeah, gutter rats. Swines, filthy swines. Wilt thou love her, comfort her? According to the teachings of Pastor Scott Williams, women were Jezebels, not to be trusted. Instead, they were to be punished physically. As you both shall live. They were punished. They were locked away. They were even hit. To the point where people were told in the church to hit either their own wives or others were used to hit um, uh, against their will. This is a hard question to ask you. Did you raise a hand to your wife? I have, yes. At the direction of anyone? Uh, Who? Scott Williams. In a disturbing escalation, Gunter Franz's former wife was also beaten in front of a group of men for not being obedient enough. Scott Williams was on the phone, instructing a senior officer to hit her as she cried and begged for mercy. Tom Baker, a long-term member of the church from Germany, was there the night it happened. The woman was stripped down to her underpants. She was laid over a chair. I was called in at the time. I was only about 23 years old. And then what happened? The other pastor got told by Scott Williams that he had to spank her. With what? A wooden stick. Gunter Franz wasn't present the night his wife was beaten with a stick. 
and he didn't know she was pregnant at the time. How did that make you feel? It makes you sick to your guts, doesn't it? In 1996, Pastor Scott Williams bid goodbye to Scotland. The Lord had sent him a message to return to Australia and bring his assembly with him. In reality, claims of arranged marriages and bizarre sex rituals. Life inside the cult had hit the press in Scotland and a series of internal church emails from the mid-1990s obtained by Four Corners reveal the Assembly's finances were also being investigated by the Scottish Charities Regulator. The documents show the Assembly was being investigated again in 2008. The Scottish Charities Regulator has refused to confirm what action, if any, was taken against the church. But Pastor Scott Williams was allowed to leave Scotland and set up shop in Australia. Here, in the picturesque coastal town of Coffs Harbour in northern New South Wales. What was life like in the church in Australia? Hell on earth. Yeah. And did all the extreme teachings and the policies come to? Absolutely, even, even worse. And it was really exciting to hear... In one of the most disturbing policies used to punish women, under the direction of Scott Williams, babies and young children were often separated from their mothers and given to others temporarily to raise. It happened to Katja Falken. How did you cope with that? Yeah, it was a nightmare. So I suppose it made us do, in, in that moment, the only way we knew how is it made us do everything we could to behave in the way they expected so that we could get the children back. And what would the children be told when they were being taken away? That they were bad and that they didn't behave. And that their par parents were bad. Emily Wassman was born into the church. Growing up in the assembly in Australia, her childhood memories are of fear, confusion and profound loneliness. The teaching was that a child was born evil and that that had to be beaten out of them with a rod of iron. So did you believe that you were born evil? That's what I was told. Filmed here as a teenager, a member of the Assembly's band, Emily Wassman says she wasn't allowed to have a life outside the church. When she was 14, she told her parents she wanted to leave the Assembly. When I didn't change my mind and made it clear that I didn't want to go anymore, they basically cut me out of their life. How did they do that? I mean, we lived together, but they stopped speaking to me. <laughs> A stranger in her own home. At the tender age of 15, Emily Wassman was sent away to Canada to live with another church member, a strategy designed to break her spirit and force her back to God. She became depressed and developed an eating disorder. In Canada, I was on a number of occasions uh, suicidal. And the only thing that would stop me from from actually going through with anything was the fear that if it didn't work, how much trouble I would be in for doing that. Emily Wassman managed to make it out of the church with her parents. And she says her experience isn't an isolated one. 
Do you know other young people who were born into the church and have left? Yes. And have they had similar struggles? Yes, all of them, everyone. These memos detail how children were to be ruled in Scott Williams' assembly. They make for disturbing reading. Do your children match up? If not, then do not be surprised that they are going to hell. James, Annie, your children are weird and unacceptable. This sick fruit will no longer be tolerated. Break the spirit of the children or be broken by the Lord. Yeah, there's certainly delusions and paranoia. And... We showed these messages to psychologist Graham Barker, who specialises in spiritual abuse and religious cults. Have you ever seen anything like this on this scale? No, but this would be consistent with a pattern of the more intimacy you can control, the greater the control you have. And how dysfunctional is this? Well, it is, it's very dysfunctional. It's, border, it's bordering on pathology. There are now over 2,000 trees planted. Every tree you see... In Australia, using church funds as prophesied again by God, Pastor Scott Williams went on another buying frenzy, purchasing a vast secluded compound for more than one and a half million dollars registered in the church's name, now Christian Assemblies International. Renovated to luxurious standards, a swimming pool, barbecue area, three houses, rolling manicured lawns. This is the headquarters of Christian Assemblies International, nestled in the isolated Cedar Valley around half an hour outside of Coffs Harbour. The gates are locked to the public. You can't see much from the street, but it's an impressive multi-million dollar compound of almost 300 acres. It's here that many former members claim they spent hundreds of hours almost every weekend working on the property under the direction of Pastor Scott Williams. They've told Four Corners that if their work and their behaviour wasn't up to scratch, they'd be punished severely. You know, we were just pure working slaves. You know, there were cases of pregnant women having to work, doing manual labour late in pregnancy, you know, digging trenches, this sort of stuff. It's just horrific, horrific stuff. Scott Williams also used church funds to buy and sell multiple apartments in the beachfront Pacific Towers complex. Williams purchased two grand apartments, a penthouse in the church's name and another for himself. It's a miracle. And he was insisting that I buy the penthouse and he buys 12 by 4. That's what it's all about. It's a miracle. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. In Coffs Harbour, the recruitment drive was in full swing. Even the former mayor, John Smith, was converted, along with a well-known local city councillor, Bob Burton. The heathens can run Coffs Harbour. Die Heiden können Coffs Harbour leiten. But they can't save the souls. Aber sie können nicht die Seelen retten. Of men and women. We, humbly relying on the blessings of Almighty God. Josh, who only wants to be known by his first name, says he was 21 when he was introduced to the church by councillor Bob Burton and quickly sucked in. Initially you are treated like royalty and that lasts for about six months. You're given everything. <laughs> Josh, did you put your hand up? You're already influenced. <laughs> Australian born, handsome and athletic. Josh says Scott Williams paid special attention to him, inviting him to attend secret men's nights. Did you attend men's nights with Scott Williams? Yes, I did. During these men's nights, we've been told that Scott Williams was very interested in people's private lives. We've been told that Scott Williams would ask people... How often they had sex. That's right. Yeah. This is an awkward question. Were people also asked how often they masturbated? Yeah. Yep. Were you? Absolutely. Yeah, they'd check in on people, see how you're travelling. 
in Australia, nothing was off limits. Josh, a new recruit, soon realised there was more to these men's nights. Pastor Scott Williams was using his brand of religion to groom men for sex. Did you see that? I did. Experienced it partially. I was in the early stages of it before I got out. It was happening behind closed doors in private. Inside the penthouse, located at the top of this apartment building in Coffs Harbour, the leader of Christian Assemblies International held regular men's nights, a mandated time for male bonding. It's also where many men say they were sexually abused by Pastor Scott Williams. In a bizarre religious ritual, men were chosen to lay naked with him. They've told Four Corners they were then forced to perform sex acts against their will. Pastor Williams justified it all using select passages from the Bible. It began 20 years earlier with Gunther Franz, Scott Williams' first convert, beloved Buntling and most senior officer, when he was just a boy in Feldafing, Germany. I was 14 when he started to sexually uh, touch me. He just said, yeah, relax, just um, more or less often the words which he uses, just surrender um, uh, yourself. Surrender. Surrender. That word has been used a million times towards me. Yeah. Gunther Franz says Scott Williams used scripture to terrify him and abuse him continuously. So he would either force me to touch him and make him come. Try to go a few times, so I do it orally as well. Um, uh, often would just massage and then just lay on the, my back and try to force himself into me. Did the abuse continue in Australia? It did, yes. How old were you when it stopped? I was in uh, my mid mid thirties. More than twenty years. Gunther Franz says he never consented, and he had no idea others were suffering in silence. Steve Falcon has prayed to forget the night Williams first sexually abused him. He was 19 years old. Interspersing each act with scripture, Williams told him this was the Lord's training. The ordeal lasted seven hours. Eventually he made me have oral sex with him. And um, it's at this point that my brain was just going absolutely crazy. I couldn't understand why I would do such a thing. Why would I um, surrender to somebody in such a way? You know, I was devastated. I was confused. Um, and I think he could see that. Steve Falcon says the abuse intensified and it continued for years, all against his consent. Did it many more times after that. How many? Probably 30 or 40, it's hard to, I don't know exactly the numbers, but over the years, many more times. As the man and his assembly grew older, Pastor Scott Williams turned his attention to the next generation of boys coming up in the church, focusing on one in particular. Scott Williams had chosen your nephew as his next protege. Yeah, another one, yeah. He groomed him from the day he was born, I believe. Ben France was 18 when Pastor Scott Williams, almost 60, appointed him as his personal private secretary and his new buntling. <laughs> he left his parents' home in Melbourne and moved to Coffs Harbour in order to be closer to Scott Williams to begin his religious training. He stays in Coffs Harbour and it will be trained and then it will sit. What were you really trained for and used for, do you believe? I don't know, apart from uh, Scott's own gratification, um, not a lot else, to be honest. 
Ben France says he was 19 when the sexual abuse began. Like so many others, during a naked massage session with Scott Williams. It continued for months, even by the roadside, inside a car. He said, put me in your mouth. And I said, no. And then, and then he said, oh, if you love me, you will. And of course, uh, the whole time, I'd been encouraged that I need to love him. It's, it's my duty. Um, so I, I didn't know what to do. I couldn't, couldn't refuse. I, uh, and there's, uh, it was disgusting. <laughs> um, if you love me, you do it. Absolutely, yeah. That's the words he used. What is being asked and what has been probably groomed into them is total obedience. So there's this idea of, you know, I'm, I'm being compliant to an anointed leader. Then there's the spiritual dimension as well, that in somehow this was actually helping them in their spiritual growth, because that's what they'd been told. Did Scott Williams then believe that he was above the law? Well, he was sanctioned by God, and uh, therefore his role was untouchable, really. And my other friends... Scott Williams may have believed he was untouchable, but the tables were about to turn. An exciting time to be together again. In August 2006, Williams spoke of his excitement for the future. Gunter France was in the front row. What was going through your mind? My main thought was, you know, when you come home, there will be justice. Scott Williams had no idea that a group of his most loyal male followers among them, his alleged victims, Gunter France, Steve Falcon, Ben France, had been secretly planning to expose him and bravely break free from the assembly. And where were you um, at the Christian assembly? Concerned that more young men were at risk, they went to the local police, where Inspector Scott Parker began to investigate. He noticed a pattern. There was a consistent pattern of desensitisation misinterpretation of the Bible and the allegations of the complainants was that that misinterpretation, including concepts of bundling or bunshaft and the love between men that Mr Williams had misinterpreted from biblical verse, was the powerful overriding theme which then completely led to the desensitisation and the indoctrination of these complainants. The police investigation ran for almost four years. During that time, the overseer, Scott Williams, wrote this stunning letter of confession to his victims. There is no excuse on my part for my actions of amorous affection, which has or have gone beyond the borders of decency and breached partial homosexuality. In December 2010, Scott Williams was committed to stand trial charged with 23 sexual offences. But just two weeks before the trial was set to commence, in February 2012, Scott Williams successfully launched a new defence. Using two medical reports obtained after he was committed to stand trial, Scott Williams claimed he was too sick to attend court due to a stroke in 2009. The Crown opposed the argument but the judge accepted Scott Williams' version of events, placing a permanent stay on the proceedings. On what medical opinion did the judge rely on? Were they independent medical reports or were they chosen by defence? The medical reports were provided by the treating physicians of Mr Williams. The judge's ruling was a devastating blow. In the eyes of his victims, Scott Williams, a master manipulator, had managed to evade justice. How can a judge make judgment in two and a half hours of what's happened to victims for over 25 years, hundreds? That's for me, mud in my face and to any other victim. Even if he is a sick man, he's still free. He still has all the money. And on top of it, he has the ability to continue on and control people who are silently still suffering in that organisation because they haven't got 
the courage to stand up against it. There are still many people in there. We went to Coffs Harbour to try and find Pastor Scott Williams, still a director of the Assembly and reportedly a recluse. He's living here in one of his apartments in the Pacific Towers. We've been told by current members of the church that he's in a wheelchair, but that he still attends church meetings and weddings and is able to communicate. Hello? Oh, hello. I'm, I'm looking for Mr Scott Williams. We got as far as the intercom, where Scott Williams' wife, Ree, answered. Have I got the right apartment? Yeah, but what did you want him about? We have a number of questions that we'd like to ask Scott. No, not, he's not very well, not well at all. Right, OK. Would you be able to let us up? Is your name Ree? Are you Scott's wife? Yeah, how do you know all of this? Put down the phone. OK, we have the right apartment. No one from Christian Assemblies International would talk to Four Corners or answer our questions. Scott Williams may have managed to avoid his day in court, but he may have more to answer for. Tens of millions of dollars flowed into the church, a registered charity in Australia. But members say the books were cooked and their donations weren't used for charitable purposes, possibly in breach of Australian laws. And how much of that approximate $20 million was used for charitable purposes? Maybe about 5%. Two to five percent. Um, the charity. Where did the ninety-five percent go? The mostly for the maintenance of the properties and into Scott Williams' uh, own pocket, and he's also obviously to maintain uh, his lifestyle. Steve Falcon worked in the assembly's finance department. He says Scott Williams was secretly stashing wads of money in the loft of his Coffs Harbour compound. Well, I saw steel boxes, basically the, the wooden beams in the loft were sawed asunder to make a secret hiding place where he could stash money in large quantities and jewellery and gold. Did you complain to authorities in Australia about the financial irregularities? I did. After we left in 2006, I did approach the tax office. Klaus Tischer says there was no response from the tax office, the ATO. The overseer, Scott Williams, he claims... We presented our findings to Susan Pascoe, the head of the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profits Commission, set up 18 months ago to regulate the conduct of registered charities. So will you be looking into Christian Assemblies International? Will you investigate? This is clearly one that uh, we've been alerted to by the media, um, and in that instance, um, we would certainly be investigating. Ultimately, if there was evidence that this was not acting in a charitable way or causing serious harm, then the charity can be deregistered. So it can be shut down? Yes. We have the power to deregister. The financial documents we have... But Susan Pascoe will need to act fast. The Abbott government is moving to axe the Commission. So we'd be back to square one. Who would, who would be overseeing charities? The, the plan the government has is to return the function to the tax office. To the ATO? Yes. The very organisation that failed to respond to complaints from members of Christian Assemblies International? Yes. Steve Falcon has found peace with a new church, but his faith has been tested. The Bible says the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for him. For the hundreds of people who've been irreversibly harmed by the cult of Christian Assemblies International, the time has come. Justice must be served. I'd like to see the organisation shut down. I'd like to see all the wealth and assets seized from them. Something of a charitable nature done. In the end, I think he should be locked up. He shouldn't be walking the streets free.
There aren't too many instincts stronger than survival. In this case, it seems obedience comes first. At its height, CAI had 700 members worldwide, dwindling to about 300 currently, with 100 of them here in Australia. In a written statement to the program, the directors of CAI said, CAI considers it would be inappropriate to comment on any allegations the Four Corners report might raise against Mr Williams. The full statement is on our website. Next week on Four Corners, terror in Iraq. An investigation into the Islamic extremist group ISIS and its pulling power in countries like Australia. Until then, good night.